Hello, I'm Stefan Schwartz, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Schwartz Report. This week, I want to pick up on something that I talked about a couple of weeks ago. And that is the matrix of consciousness and how science is slowly beginning to change the way it looks at the other beings on this planet. To my surprise, I confess, on April the 19th, at New York University, a group of scientists from different disciplines issued a declaration. And in that declaration, they said, and you can see, First, there is strong scientific support for attributes of consciousness experience to other mammals and even to birds and even to insects. Second, the empirical evidence indicates that at least a realistic possibility of conscious experience in all vertebrates, including reptiles, amphibians, and fishes, and many invertebrates including at a minimum cephalopods, mollusks, decapods, crustaceans, and insects. And third, when there is a realistic possibility of conscious experience in an animal, it is irresponsible to ignore that possibility in decisions affecting that animal. We should consider the welfare risks and the use of evidence to inform our responses to these risks. Now that's a very carefully worded, very academic, conservative perspective. But what it's telling us is what I was telling you a few weeks ago. We live in a matrix of consciousness. Consciousness is not limited just to humans, as most people thought for the last couple of centuries. Consider, for instance, bees. Now look at this video. This is a bee <laughs> playing with a ball. The bees come into this, this uh, I don't know, laboratory setup, and there are on the on the the floor of the little space that they the scientists have created. There are these little balls, and you can watch the bee. They play with them. They roll them around. We also know that bees can recognize people and that they can recognize different kinds of flowers and which ones are the ones that they want to get nectar from and which ones they don't. Now, this is a, an insect with a brain about the size of a, a sewing pin. Or fish who recognize themselves in the mirror and they can recognize other people. So this attitude that we have that other living beings are sort of organic automatons is wrong. That in fact, these beings have consciousness. They have feelings, probably, that they recognize and can make calculations about things. As I think I said in the last time I was talking about this, I met an octopus when I was on one of my expeditions down in the Caribbean. We were searching for and found a previously unknown wreck on the seafloor. 
the Brig Leander. And I would come back from diving on the archaeological site. We would moor for the night off Riding Rock, which is a, a limestone ridge in the Caribbean on, on the banks uh, in the Bahamas. And I would go down and dive, one very deep. And I discovered there was a octopus down there. And I wanted to see if I could get it to come out. And so I would take a spear and put a piece of fish on it and go down and hold it and, and it would come out and take the fish off the end of the spear. And, and then I would hold the spear back over the days closer and closer until I was just holding the fish in my hand. And the octopus would come down and stroke my hand as it was eating the fish. And it wouldn't do that for anybody else. It recognized me, even though we all wore the same dive suits and had the masks on and the tanks on our back. Somehow it recognized me. Now here's a, a picture of another octopus. This is an octopus whose name is Paul. I called the octopus that I knew George, although I didn't know whether it was really a male or a female. But here's an octopus who's a male. His name is Paul. And Paul became quite famous because he correctly forecast the results of Germany's seven games in South Africa and the finishing of, of the tournament by predicting the Spanish victory in the final game. And this caused a sensation as it was uh, the media got hold of it. Now, that's telling us something else. In this matrix of consciousness, consciousness, a part of it is non-local. That is, it's not dependent on your physiology. It's part of the continuity of consciousness. Uh, research that we're doing, that there's a part of consciousness, the eternal self is what I call it, religion calls it the soul, that exists before incarnation, during incarnation, and then continues upon physical death. And apparently, as with Octopus Paul, these animals have access also to the non-local aspect of consciousness. This is giving us a completely different view of how reality is structured and that information is causal and fundamental. In Washington and California and several other states, this is beginning to be recognized by lawmakers Several states have begun passing laws where they consider the octopus, based on the research, as a species with a strong evidence of sentience. British law was recently amended to consider octopuses as sentient beings, along with crabs and lobsters. Now think about that. When you begin to think about the matrix of life, you realize that the way we treat the other beings on Earth is in many cases really ugly. You know, I was thinking about it as I was reading the, this, this British law, and I thought about throwing a lobster into a boiling pot of water. That's the way that people typically cook them. But if you realized that they were sentient beings, and that you were in effect torturing them, what would that make you think about? And to give you a sense of, you know, how smart these beings are, 
look at this. This is Coco. Coco was a gorilla. She died a few years ago. She was 46. She had an IQ of between 75 and 85, it was estimated. Now, the average IQ in America is about 98 with 34% between 98 and 85. So this gorilla was as smart as some people. She had a vocabulary of a thousand words and understood 2000 words. And she learned sign language and could have conversations with people. As you can see in this picture, she's having a conversation with an anthropologist. And it's not just that, the gorillas. Here's Bunny the talking dog. Bunny has a vocabulary of about 92 words. And they've developed a device, a, a sort of communicative augmentation device. And the dog can press the buttons, as you can see, that express the words that she's thinking about. And she's thinking. Hi, Bunny. And can tell you what she wants or what she wants to do or what she'd like to eat. So have you ever had a pet dog? Did you realize that that dog could think, could be aware of you, could be frightened or nurtured by the way people behaved around her? This is a whole new way of looking at the world. And it is beginning to impress itself on science and on the culture as a whole. And it's going to make a difference as to how we behave. Let me give you a final example. These are monarch butterflies. Now a monarch butterfly has a brain about the size of the point of a pin. And yet they migrate back and forth. You can see here are the migration patterns. They go all the way down to Mexico and they go all the way back up into the Northern States and even parts of British Columbia as they migrate up and down. And the thing that's extraordinary is that they go to the same tree to nest overnight, to stop overnight, that their parents did. And their children who will come back will do the same thing. And if you cut down the tree, whatever that, that generation, as they're flying back, they'll pick a new tree and it'll each generation will stay with that tree. Now, how is it possible with a brain the size of a pin that first of all, they know how to migrate from north to south, and second of all, that they stop in the same trees all the way down. I tell you all these stories, the bees and the gorillas and the dogs and the butterflies and the octopuses, because I think this is suggesting to us that as climate change pushes us into crisis, part of what we're going to have to do in order to prepare ourselves for that, to survive it in any state of comfort, is we need to begin to think about the world and our place in it quite differently. Earth is not an exploitable bank account left to us by a rich uncle to do with as we will. Instead, it is a matrix of consciousness. And the choices we should make should foster well-being for everybody because other research shows that plants have a level of consciousness, 
fungus. All of life has a kind of con some kind of consciousness, and these, this consciousness is interlinked and interdependent. And when you harm part of the ecosystem of the earth, you harm all kinds of things. And our plastic and our petroleum and our toxins, all the awful things we're doing to parts of the earth have huge ramifications. And that if we're going to survive with any kind of civilization, we need to become aware that we are in a matrix of consciousness. Gaia, one researcher called it. We need to recognize this and we need to develop new technologies to replace these old, dangerous, toxic technologies. We're beginning moving to solar, for instance, electric vehicles. Slowly, we are just beginning, but the pressure is on because the effects of climate change and the crises it's creating are growing more and more intense. There are now something like 117 million climate change migrants, and there's going to be millions more. How are we going to deal with that? How are we going to survive? How are we going to lead a life of some comfort and well-being? I suggest to you that the only answer to that question is that we must make the, from the promotion of well-being at every level our first priority. You can still make profit, but profit can no longer be the first priority as it is today. Instead, we need to come together, the cultures of the world, all the countries, and address our impact on the earth in a very different way. Because if we don't, the misery and suffering and death is going to be unimaginable. So it gets down to each of us and the choices we make. And I hope that you will join me in always choosing the choice that fosters well-being. Thank you.